lecture, we'll be looking at data exploration or exploratory data analysis. But when we have a lot of data, what do we do with it? Right? The first thing we may want to do is to say, okay, I have 10,000 rows of data, but let me get a handle on this. Let me get a broad idea of what this data is talking about. Okay, So that's what a data summary is. Right? So why do we need data summary? We want to get a handle on this large amount of data that we have. Okay, if we've got several different points of data, but there's some way by which we need to be able to say, okay, this is what kind of summarizes what's going on in this data. One of the most uh, commonly used summaries of data are measures of central tendency. Okay, of course that sounds like a mouthful, but what do we mean by that? Okay, suppose we have, let's say the sales of uh, 100 companies given to us. Right? So it's just 100 numbers. Each number represents the sales of a particular company during a particular year. Right? Now suppose somebody comes along and say, can you describe these 100 numbers by using just one single number so that I have a good handle on this? Right? You give me 100 different numbers. I can't keep all that in my mind. But can you say what is one number that describes all of these 100 numbers? Right? So that's what we call as a measure of central tendency. It is one number that is representative of the collective. Okay. Of course, one may think that there's uh, the only way in which you can get a measure of central tendency is to take the average. Okay. That's the most common way of doing uh, measure of central tendency. Okay. So that's the mean of the numbers, right? You you just calculate the average of all the numbers. But that's not the only possibility. Another useful possibility is the median, right? Which is if you arrange the numbers in order, then the number that comes in the middle could be considered as the most representative of the lot. Okay, so mean is one measure of central tendency. Median is another equally valid and sometimes much more, uh, much less misleading representation of central tendency of a set of numbers. And yet a third one could be mode, right? Of all the items, the one that occurs most frequently might be the one that is most representative, okay? Now, it depends on the purpose for which you're using the measure of central tendency. There's nothing to say this is more valid than the other. It all depends on the purpose. Okay, let's consider an example of mean, okay? So there's a room full of people and, you know, you've got, uh, I don't know, maybe 100 people sitting in that room you consider the average income of those 100 people. Okay, let's say you have some number there. Let's say 100,000 is the average annual income of the people in that room. Okay, now let's say in walks Bill Gates, right? What happened to the average annual income, right? Assuming that Bill Gates' annual income is, uh, you know, several hundred million dollars a year, this average just skyrocketed. Okay, so now you may say the average of this uh, average income of the people in this room, uh, I don't know what it is, maybe it, it becomes uh, $2 million now from $100,000, right? But you would not really think of that as a true representation of the average uh, of the income of that room of people, right? You would say, well, most of the people have incomes, you know, between, let's say, 80000 120000 so to say that the average income is, or to say that the most uh, representative way of describing that room of people might not be to say that the average income is uh, $2 million. Instead, you may say it's still like $100,000, okay? So in this sense, the mean really uh, has is not a great representation when you have what are called as outliers, right? In this case, the income of Bill Gates is a big outlier meaning it's so far away from the typical value in that set that it tends to distort the mean or which distort the average. However, it does very little, it has very little impact on either the, uh, the median or the mode, right? The median is the middle value. And if you add one more person, the middle value may shift uh, one position, right? So from 100,000, it may become, let's say 105,000 or something like that, right? A very small deviation. Uh, maybe it doesn't even change at all, okay, because there may be a lot of people with that middle value income, and so the median doesn't change at all, probably, 
Okay, so in that sense, the median is usually a very good description uh, of central tendency, right? Which is why when uh, governments uh, report statistics like uh, you know the uh, household incomes and so on, they don't say mean household income. Instead, they say median household income, right? So that uh, outliers don't distort the value. Similarly, the mode, which is the most frequently occurring value, uh, is usually not impacted at all by outliers. Okay. Uh, in fact, many times when statistics are told to you, when somebody reports the mean of something to justify their point of view, uh, your you know your antennas should immediately go up. You should say, okay, fine, that's the mean that you're citing, but can you please tell me the median? Okay. So many times when people want to mislead, they use the mean. Okay. So in that sense, uh, you know, median is usually a better representation of central tendency than mean. Okay. So this is what we have just discussed. Then there are measures of location, right? In other words, given a value. So let's say again, I have hundred uh, uh, company uh, sales values. Take a given company sales value. You say, well, in this continuum, where does it fall? Okay. If you arrange all the values from lowest to highest, given a particular company sales, where does it fall? It does it fall in the top 25%, top 50%, or is it falling at the 25th percentile, which is the you know one quarter of the way down the road, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so that's what is showing here. So here we have arranged all the values from highest to lowest, and then we see how many values are equal to or less than that particular value. Right? So 159 is the maximum. So 100% of the values are either equal to 159 or less than it. <coughs> and 110 is sort of near the middle and therefore 55% of the values are either equal to 110 or below it and of course the lowest value uh, is only 0% is below actually if you include it then you will say 1 tenth or something is below it okay uh, but of course when you have large number of values you can roughly say that the lowest value is at the 0th percentile and the highest value is at the 100th percentile okay so that's the measure of location In R, you can get a basic summary by using the summary function. Okay, so for example, here I have read the data from a file, a data file, bostonhousing.csv. It's in the comma-separated values format. We have read that into a variable, into an R variable called H data. Uh, so that's as you probably already know from prior uh, examples that this is a data frame. It's a frame of data, in which, mean, which means that it's a data set that has multiple attributes, and we have values for all the attributes. Uh, now, to get a summary of this, we can just say summary H data. Okay, summary H data. So just the function summary, and you supply the data frame, and you get a complete summary uh, of the data. Right, and let's take a simple example here and to see what kind of values it shows. Uh, this is one of the attributes in the data frame, CRIM. And summary shows you the minimum value, the maximum value. So the min for crim happens to be 0 0.00632, max happens to be 88.97. And then it shows you the median, which is if the values were arranged in lowest to highest, the median is uh, 0 0.25, that's the middle value. It also shows you the mean, 3.6. Notice how big the difference is between the median and the mean. Okay, so because th there are clearly outliers. For example, 88 is most likely an outlier because the middle value is 0 0.25 and the highest value is 88. So it looks like it's a major outlier. Okay, and uh, you also see then, so you've got the me minimum, maximum, median, and mean four values. And then it also shows you the first quartile and the third quartile values. What is the first quartile? The first quartile is the value that fall that falls at the 25 percent level that is when you organize the data from lowest to highest okay let's say there are 1000 uh, elements of data the value at the 250th position from the top which is from the lowest to highest so the 250th position value that is the first quartile uh, median of course is the middle value so it's really at the 500th position and uh, third quartile, if you have 1,000 data, will be the value at the 750th position, okay, which is the 75th percentile. So that's what the basic summary shows. So it gives you a good idea of, uh, of the whole data. 
right? So you're able to take this data consisting of, let's say 1000 elements. In this case, it's 506 data points and using just um, six points, six data elements, which is the minimum first quartile, median, mean, third quartile and maximum, just six numbers describe to us the complete data set. It gives us an idea. Obviously, there's loss of information when we compress, uh, you know, 506 numbers to just six numbers, but it gives us a broad idea of what's going on. Okay, so that's what the basic summary, data summary does in R. Having looked at the basic summary, let's look at some descriptors of the spread of data, right? So let's say you have 100 sales data numbers for some 100 companies, we can find the average or median, we can find the measures of central tendency, but we are also interested in the spread of the data. So one measure of spread is the range, which is simply the maximum value minus the minimum value. Okay, that's the overall range within which all the values fall. That gives an idea of, uh, you know, where the values are. And another interesting uh, description of the spread of data is the IQR, which is the interquartile range, which is really the 75th percentile minus the 25th percentile. In other words, the value, if you sort the values from lowest to highest, this is the difference between the value at the 75th percentile position and the 25th percentile position. So if you have a thousand data elements, then this would be the IQR would be, and they're sorted from lowest to highest. IQR would be the difference of the value at the, at the 750th position and the value at the 250th position. That's the interquartile range. Uh, another descriptor of the spread of data is what is called as the variance. We'll be looking at formulas for variance, but essentially variance is computed around the mean. So you've got the values, you've got the mean, the average. Now you want to see how the values are spread around this average. Okay, so for every data element, you can find the difference of it from the average. Okay, so for example, if the average is 50 and one of the values is 60, well, that value is 10 points of the average, right? And the average is 50, another value is 35. That value is 15 points away from the average, okay? So it could be either above or below. That's the difference between the value and the average. But of course, you know, this could be positive or negative. You know, for values greater than the average, if you take the value minus the average, that would be positive. If the value is less than the average, then the value minus average would be negative. So if you simply add up all of these, the positives and negatives would cancel out, you won't get a great uh, idea. So what you do is you square up the deviations, okay? So you take the deviation for each value, you square it, right? And then you take the mean of these squares. That is what is called as variance, right? We'll see the formula, so that'll make a lot more sense rather than a verbal description. Standard deviation is nothing but the square root of the variance. So all of these, are measures of how the values are spread across the range, right? So measures of central tendency tell you something like what is a representative value and spread or, uh, you know, dispersion, measures of dispersion tell you how the values are spread across the entire range. Uh, in statistics, they use two terms, parameter and statistic. Okay. Now, although in this particular course, we are not going to be overly concerned with, uh, you know, st traditional statistical terminology, but it's a good idea to understand these two terms when you read a book or when you read some article or something to, uh, to, you know, to understand what exactly they mean. First of all, we already saw that in traditional statistics, when you want to make inferences about a population, right, which is, let's say you've got, uh, you want to find out the average income uh, of a person in the United States. Okay, so we've got a population of over 300 million. Let's say of that uh, around uh, 150 million are people who, who uh, you know, pay income tax and have incomes. So what is the average income of all of these people? Okay, now one way would be to find the income of every single person and find the average. Okay, that would be a tedious process. Another way would be to simply take a sample. Okay, let's say you take 10,000 people carefully selected that they represent the population and then take the average of these 10,000 and then say that is the average of the population. 
Okay, so that's the difference between sample and population. The 10,000 people we chose, that is the sample. The complete population of people in the country, that is the population. Okay, and we make measurements on the sample and infer measurements about the population. Okay, so in statistics, the when you measure things on the entire population, they are called parameters. Right, so if you actually take the uh, every single individual earning individual in the US, take their income and find the average, then that is the population parameter. Okay, there is no uncertainty about it. That that is the actual average of incomes in the US. Okay, that's a population parameter. If you take a sample and calculate the average of that sample, that is called as a sample statistic. Okay, and a sample statistic is used to arrive at an estimate for the parameter, for the population parameter. Okay, so the term statistic and parameter are slightly different in that sense.